The second uncrewed orbital flight test of Boeing's CST-100 Starliner is on hold as mission teams troubleshoot an issue having to do with the spacecraft's propulsion system. Starliner was originally supposed to launch from Florida's Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on a crucial uncrewed mission to the International Space Station for NASA. The uncrewed mission is part of NASA's commercial crew program, during which the Starliner spacecraft will demonstrate rendezvous and docking capabilities with the International Space Station, followed by undocking and landing in the western United States. The Boeing Orbital Flight Test 2 mission was supposed to get off the ground on August 3, but unexpected valve position indications on Starliner's propulsion system prompted a delay. Early in the launch countdown for the August 3 attempt, mission teams detected indications that not all valves were in the proper configuration needed for launch. Mission teams decided to halt the countdown to further analyze the issue. NASA and Boeing worked through several unsuccessful efforts to troubleshoot the incorrect valve indications, and later the mission teams decided to roll the Atlas V and Starliner back to the vertical integration facility for further inspection and testing. Engineering teams have ruled out several potential causes, including software, but additional time is needed to complete the assessment. According to NASA, the mission teams will take whatever time is necessary to ensure Starliner is ready for its important uncrewed flight test to the space station and will look for the next available opportunity after resolution of the issue. Starliner's first attempt to dock with the International Space Station was in December 2019, but that mission suffered serious software problems after reaching orbit, calling off a docking attempt with the station. As a result, Starliner had to return to Earth prematurely, and a subsequent investigation showed it almost experienced a dire flight anomaly while re-entering the atmosphere. Starliner does not have an infinite launch window, and NASA did not state when they would be ready to make the next launch attempt of the OFT-2 mission. A successful OFT-2 mission would allow NASA and Boeing to proceed with a crewed flight test with three NASA astronauts on board as soon as the end of this year. NASA's Perseverance rover on Mars has begun drilling into the surface of the Red Planet to collect the first-ever piece of Martian rock that is destined to be brought to Earth. After days of seeking the perfect spot to drill on the floor of Mars' Jezero crater, on August 6, the rover drilled through a rock core in an effort to collect the first Martian samples. The sampling process was autonomous from beginning to end. Though the rover's coring bit and percussive drill performed as planned, the sample tube was shown to be empty after the drilling process. According to NASA, the agency is assembling a response team to analyze the data, and once the team has a better understanding of what happened, it will be able to ascertain when to schedule the next sample collection attempt. The mission team added that the empty tube is more likely a result of the rock target not reacting the way they expected during coring, and less likely a hardware issue with the sampling and caching system. The drill hole is the first stage of the sampling process that is expected to take about 11 days to complete. Even though no samples were collected, the rover's successful drilling marks a major accomplishment for the mission, and it is the first step in collecting a series of 30 or more rock samples from across Jezero Crater. After collecting the required number of samples from the Martian surface, the rover will store them in metal canisters and leave them behind on the Martian surface to continue its mission. Later this decade, a second smaller rover, to be built by the European Space Agency, will arrive on Mars and will travel across the surface picking up the sample canisters left behind by Perseverance. The canisters will be loaded into a protective container and placed into the Mars Ascent vehicle that will blast into the sky, placing the container into orbit around Mars. The sample container will be met in orbit and caught by a European satellite. This return orbiter will act as a cargo ship, bringing the precious rock and soil specimens back to Earth. If and when the samples arrive back on Earth, researchers can analyze them to determine a precise date for when they formed. If the samples are successfully collected and dated, it would be the first ever pinpointing of the age of a rock on Mars. We don't expect the samples to arrive home until at least 2031. NASA's Mars Helicopter Ingenuity has safely completed its 11th flight on Mars on August 5. During the flight, the 1.8 kg helicopter climbed to an altitude of 12 meters as it heads downrange at a speed of 5 meters per second. During its 130.9 seconds long flight, the chopper traveled a distance of 380 meters in the northwestern direction to its previous location. With 11 successful flights, the solar-powered rotorcraft is serving as a technology and operations demonstration for the potential use of flying probes on future missions to Mars and other worlds. Virgin Galactic says that it has reopened sales for the public to buy a ticket to space on their Spaceship 2 vehicle, with seat prices starting at $450,000. Spaceship 2 will offer customers an hour-long total experience, including a few minutes above what the American government considers to be the limit of space. The announcement of the ticket sale came on August 5, three weeks after the company's founder Richard Branson took a high-profile flight to the edge of space. 
Virgin Galactic says it will have three offerings, single-seat reservations which will begin at $450,000, multi-seat reservations for families and friends, and an option to buy out all six seats on a given flight for a modest premium. Moreover, the company offers seats for microgravity research and professional astronaut training, which will be priced at $600,000 each. As part of its quarterly financial results, the company said it was immediately starting ticket sales, which had been suspended for several years. Virgin Galactic also previously announced that it would raffle off two seats on Spaceship Two to people who donate to Space for Humanity, a non-profit with the stated goal of helping to democratize space. The company revealed Thursday during an investor call that more than 125,000 people from 190 countries have donated. Virgin Galactic's next space flight is scheduled for late September in New Mexico with the Italian Air Force. Now, let us discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. On August 6, SpaceX stacked a Starship prototype vehicle atop a super-heavy booster at the Starbase launch pad for the first time. This 120-meter tall vehicle is now the world's tallest rocket, surpassing NASA's Apollo-era Saturn V launch vehicle and also the upcoming SLS rocket. Let's examine last week's developments at Starbase that led to the stacking operation. On Sunday, August 1, CEO Elon Musk shared a stunning photograph of the enormous Super Heavy Booster 4 prototype that was undergoing works inside the high bay at the Starbase factory. Later, one by one, the 29 Raptor engines of the booster began moving toward the high bay for installation. Within 15 hours after spotting the first Raptor of the booster, SpaceX employees completed installing all the 29 engines of the launch vehicle. It was the first time SpaceX has ever attempted to install more than three Raptor engines on a Starship or Super Heavy prototype. The engines were installed in a 20 plus 8 plus 1 configuration, in which the outer 20 engines lack the ability to gimbal, but are capable of throttling up or down. In the meantime, teams also installed four grid fins to the fully stacked booster. Unlike the titanium grid fins on Falcon boosters, Super Heavy's fins are built out of welded steel and not designed to retract, meaning that they will remain in their deployed configuration at all times. These grid fins attached to the booster's top edge are used for guiding rockets during high-speed re-entry. Moreover, the load point for booster catching will be just below these grid fins. By Tuesday, August 3rd, workers completed the booster assembly works, and the giant booster was transported to the launch site on a self-propelled modular transporter for pre-flight preparations. The rocket equipped with 29 methane-burning Raptor engines is capable of producing over 66,000 kilonewtons of thrust. After arriving at the launch site, workers attached the booster to a massive crane that lifted the launch vehicle free from its transport stand and carefully lowered it onto the orbital pad's launch table. Simultaneously, teams were also working on the assembly of Starship 20, the first orbital-class Starship prototype. The ship was outfitted with all six of its Raptor engines on Tuesday. Orbital ships have three gimballing Raptors optimized for sea level and three fixed engines optimized for vacuum, necessitating a far larger bell nozzle. You can see cutouts being cut inside the engine skirt of the prototype to accommodate the large diameter vacuum variants. The rocket's conical nose section joined it in the high bay later that evening, and SpaceX wasted no time stacking and welding the two Starship halves together, effectively completing its basic structure on August 4. The 50 meters tall spacecraft covered in black thermal protection tiles left the high bay on August 5 and took to the highway for a brief trip from the Starbase factory to the launch site. The next day a massive crane lifted Ship 20 and briefly placed it atop of the massive booster, setting a new record for the world's tallest rocket. The ship and the booster were mated for about an hour for fit checks, during which time the two vehicles posed a towering sight. A fit check is done to ensure that the booster and ship attachment points are in perfect alignment and there are no dimensional errors that occurred during the manufacturing process. Starship stacking occurred exactly one year after Starship Serial No. 5 completed a test flight to an altitude of 150 meters. This is great progress at Starbase over the past year. Musk shared stunning photographs of the enormous rocket via Twitter and said that it is a dream come true to see the vehicle he designed finally stacked. He added that the booster height was originally planned to be 70 meters, but the SpaceX team eliminated a half barrel for manufacturing efficiency, so now the booster is approximately 69 meters tall. The ship was unstacked on Friday afternoon and was sent back to the build site to continue pre-flight preparations. Musk outlined four significant items that SpaceX aims to complete over the next two weeks in preparing Starship 20 for an orbital launch. The first step will be to complete the installation of the thermal protection tiles of the ship. He said that Ship 20's heat shield installation is approximately 98% done, but the remaining tiles are unique shapes requiring machining. 
They will also add thermal protection system to booster engines to protect all 29 engines of the booster from atmospheric re-entry heating. At the launch site, SpaceX needs to complete work on ground propellant storage tanks and add a quick disconnect arm to the top of the recently built launch tower. The quick disconnect arm or the automated ground umbilical system connects power and fuel lines to the rocket before launch. Once completed, SpaceX will proceed to carry out pre-flight ground tests at the launch site. Booster tests will be conducted on the orbital launch pad, and the ship tests will be carried out on the suborbital launch pad B. The test campaign is expected to initiate with a series of proof tests to ensure the stainless steel vehicle is strong enough to withstand the stresses of an orbital flight. The proof tests will be followed by static fire tests involving all the 29 engines of the booster and the six engines of the ship. Once the pre-flight tests are completed without any issues, the launch vehicles will be integrated once again ahead of the orbital flight test. For its first orbital flight test, the Starship, propelled by its Super Heavy booster, will take off from the orbital launch pad at the Starbase launch site. Around two minutes after liftoff, the Super Heavy booster will separate from the Starship and will land in the Gulf of Mexico, around 32 kilometers offshore. The ship will continue its flight around the globe to complete a targeted landing around 100 kilometers northwest of the coast of Hawaii. The whole flight will last around 90 minutes. SpaceX hasn't announced a date for the launch, although in a Federal Communications Commission filing in May, the company said it was targeting a six-month period that started on June 20. But the launch can take place until SpaceX receives a launch license from the Federal Aviation Administration. That license is dependent on the completion of an environmental assessment of Starship and Super Heavy launches from Boca Chica currently underway. Even when complete, the draft version will be released for public comment, which would then be incorporated into the final version. Moreover, the report may recommend the FAA perform a more thorough environmental impact study, which would further delay any launch license. While SpaceX is doing all it can to launch Starship into orbit as early as possible, SpaceX's rivaling company Blue Origin called Starship as immensely complex and high-risky for NASA's moon missions. The criticism came just days after Blue Origin's protest against NASA's decision to award the lunar landing system contract to SpaceX was denied. This suggests that the company isn't taking the contract loss lightly. In an infographic published on Blue Origin's website, the company said that using Starship to transport NASA astronauts to the lunar surface is an immensely complex and high-risky approach, while its Blue Moon lander is safe, low-risk and fast. Blue Origin wrote that there are an unprecedented number of technologies, developments, and operations that have never been done before for Starship to land on the Moon. Starship will have to refuel in orbit if it's going to reach the Moon, which Blue Origin cited as an example of an unprecedented process. In the graphic, the company argues that SpaceX would have to fly the Starship more than 10 times flawlessly to allow a single spacecraft to have enough fuel to send astronauts to the moon. But how Blue Origin arrived at its claims as the infographic suggests is unclear. Blue Origin also said SpaceX's launch site in Texas has never launched a Starship into orbit, although Blue Origin has also never conducted an orbital flight. In its infographic, Blue Origin said that its own lunar lander, which more closely resembles lunar landers of previous NASA moon missions, has a crew hatch just 32 feet from the ground, whereas SpaceX's enormous Starship has a hatch 126 feet off the ground. Moreover, the infographic incorrectly depicted the Starship by using the wrong scale to represent the height of lunar vehicles. What the infographic fails to include is the cost to construct the lunar lander and get it off the ground, which was a major part of NASA's final decision. SpaceX bid $2.9 billion, while Blue Origin was roughly double at $5.99 billion. As part of its criticism, Blue Origin also shared a white paper outlining how choosing one lander is against American supremacy in space. The company cited Boeing's setbacks with its Starliner spacecraft as evidence of the necessity to pick two vehicles for the HLS program. In short, Blue Origin isn't ready to accept defeat, and its repeated efforts to undermine the competition aren't a particularly good look either. Meanwhile, recently, Texas oil regulators voted unanimously in favor of SpaceX in a dispute over the land already being used to build the Starbase complex. SpaceX's Lone Star Mineral Development Unit is now designated as the operator of inactive oil and natural gas wells on the 24 acres of land being developed to support the Starship rocket launch facility. SpaceX will soon drill natural gas wells near Starbase to use the methane to fuel Starship and Super Heavy launch vehicles and also for electric power generation. Moving on to other Starship updates, in a small but important step towards activating the tank farm, SpaceX has sleeved one of its propellant storage tanks with a cryo shell for the first time. The cryo shell will enclose the GSE tanks, allowing the company to fill the gap between them with an insulating material. 
With those shells and insulation, the tank farm should be more than capable of storing cryogenic liquid propellants for days or even weeks. The tank farm now consists of three ground support equipment tanks installed, and a fourth GSE tank was rolled out to the launch site last Thursday. Furthermore, four cryo shells are more or less complete at the build site. Work is in progress to complete the super heavy catching mechanism, with more parts of the catching arm arriving at the launch site last week. Urkex, a 3D animator, recently shared an animated video on Twitter, depicting the booster catching mechanism. Elon Musk praised the work for being close to real, and added that the catch point will be off to the side, because SpaceX doesn't want the booster to hit the launch mount in case the catch fails. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.